Let's get a word on this and a few of the other big stories of the day. Isabel Oakshot is with us, Talks International Editor. Isabel, good afternoon. Hi. I mean, I think this stuff's absolutely bonkers. The trouble is, it is going to backfire because what will happen is that any employer who is or would be employer who is thinking, well, shall I, shan't I create an extra job here? Um, I could do with an extra pair of hands on this, that or the other. But you know what? Actually, it's way more of a headache than it's worth because yeah. I could take someone on and, you know, it becomes obvious in the first few weeks that this isn't going to work out for whatever reason. And yet if I let them go, I'm going to find myself dragged through the tribunal system. I mean, it, it is completely crazy, this. It doesn't boost the economy. Yeah. All it does is make employers incredibly cautious about who they take on, and that can't be in anyone's interest. And the point about flexible working, which will be the sort of default for everyone, I mean, how does this work? So you turn up at a job, I don't know, maybe you've got a retail job in Next, and you do the interview and they say, yeah, that's fine, you know, you can do the job. Um, and then you say to the boss, yeah, but I'm going to have to do it on a flexible basis. So, uh, and that will be your right to, to make that demand? Well, by the sounds of things, I mean, we've even seen this proposed recently in relation to teachers, that they should be able to work flexibly at the beginning of the end of the day or be able to bank the hours that they would normally spend mm. marking homework in a staff room and have it as a sort of time at home towards the end of the week. I mean, I just think that this stuff has gone completely the wrong way. We've got a massive problem with growth in our country. We've got a yeah. productivity problem and we've got very, very sluggish growth. I mean, we've got to a sorry situation where chancellors like to boast that we're in growth and it's sort of 0.5 or something. That's not growth as other booming parts of the world recognise it. We're not going to solve productivity or get our economy really, really going great guns by giving workers ludicrous numbers of extra rights to just be at home or do things their own way. In the end, um, business and employment is, is a transaction. It's not some kind of form of charity. It is a transaction that has to work for the employ employer. Bottom line is, if your employee is not earning you more money, providing you more value than you are having to pay that employer, employee, then the equation doesn't work anymore. This isn't some kind of, you know, welfare system. Yeah. It's, it is about making money for the company or employer concerns. But I also sense, and I said it at the beginning, Isabel, I don't, I don't know if you caught my words there, that this is in the kind of DNA of people like Angela Rayner because they, they want a battle that doesn't need to be fought. And that that's almost, yes, part, I get it, we're a democracy, we're not North Korea, people can have whatever political views they, they like, but it is that desire, that sort of almost firebrand lefty desire to have a, a scrap with uh, landlords, Bosses, these are all the evil people of this world and we need to fight them with our trusty sword of justice and get things sorted for the average worker. As if, you know, they're, they're still having rows that people might have had in 1856 about workers' rights. Forgetting the fact that most EU rights in the workplace, as I understand it, were taken from the template of this country because our workers' rights were so good. Yeah, it's exactly that, isn't it? It's let's pick a lefty fight, you know, let's let's go out there with our guns blazing yep. and you know, we're going to man the barricades and now we're in charge. This is workers versus evil bosses and corporate greed and so on. You know, actually, as you said, I think in your introduction, is this stuff really needed? And are zero hours contracts really so bad? I mean, huge numbers of people work on this basis and it suits both sides. Nobody has to take a zero hours contract. There's yep. plenty of jobs that are not zero hours contracts. These things exist because they're actually convenient for everybody. Yeah. And in the end, I would like to say, imagine we're going to come back here in a year's time and all this has been enacted. I'm going to be very willing to bet a significant amount of metaphoric money, because I'm not in the business of really betting, that this has done nothing whatsoever to boost productivity or growth in the country and quite possibly will be going backwards because you don't fire things up in this way.
Yeah. Well, when I was, I was just thinking, Isabel, when I was about 16, I worked, well, actually younger than that, when I was at school, uh, was probably 14, I worked in a chippy part-time. It was it was a quid an hour. It was fantastic. I chopped up the chips and every now and again I'd get to fry a sausage. It was brilliant. I, lo I loved the job and I was earning more than any of my mates because I had a paper round in the morning as well, so life was good. Um, presumably on this basis, when I hit 16 and I was still doing some stuff at the uh, at the Kent Fish Bar, uh, I would have, imagine I would have so somehow, I would have um, consumed all of these new rights. Like, he wouldn't have been able to say to me, as he used to do, oh, you know, can you not do Tuesday this week, but could, could you do Friday? Um, he wouldn't have been able to fire me because I'd have had full-time rights from... I mean, it's laughable that a 16-year-old kid in a part-time job in a chip shop would take on the rights of somebody in full-time adult employment. Completely absurd. And equally, you know, sometimes my son does a bit of building work on projects that come up, and he's, he's a teenager as well. He wouldn't expect to have a load of rights. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a job and someone needs an extra pair of hands to paint a wall or whatever. You're not expecting to have, a, have some kind of rights over that. You know, yeah. you're offered a bit, of, a bit of cash or, you know, you've got to do it properly, I'm sure, but you're offered a bit of money um, to do a couple of days' work and it's casual. And that's how, you know, thriving economies work and it's beneficial to everybody. Um, as for the whole tribunal thing, I, I've actually experienced this. I had somebody who worked for me for a matter of hours uh, in a domestic role um, over a period, spread out over a period of nine days, and then tried to sue me. I wow. mean, this, I, and, and trust me, I really didn't do anything wrong here. I mean, this was the most boring arrangement known to man. It was a bit of cleaning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I genuinely, I'm still, I'm still kind of yeah. flabbergasted that anyone would use an industrial tribunal system having done, oh, I think she did about, I don't know, about 18 hours work or something, um, decided she didn't really fancy it and uh, decided to kick off. And, you know, I, I sort of paid to make it go away because who wants to be spending their time dealing oh. with that? Only in the sh only in the shires can the cleaner sue the, uh, the the person that asked them to do a bit of gentle dusting. For God's sake, um, we we live in a very strange world. Well, we're going to continue to talk about that throughout the course of the program. Um, let's talk about this one. Rachel Reeves needing you know apparently an extra twenty five billion in tax rises to avoid austerity. This was a study by the Institute for Fiscal Studies found that that could be the amount needed to avoid that scenario. Does everyone, though, still remember when she said this as Shadow Chancellor? There are no additional tax rises needed beyond the ones that I've set out. I want to lead the most pro-growth, the most pro-business Treasury that our country has ever seen, with a laser focus on delivering for working people. Now, the funny thing about Rachel Reeves, as, as, as you also know, Isabel, I mean, she was always seen as somebody who was on the right of the, the, the Labour Party. I can remember, and I always kept the article uh, buried in my, uh, in, in my bookmarks on, on my computer because I can remember her talking about um, welfare and austerity back in 2010 or something and saying, you know, if, if I was in power, I would be going further. And I never forget that quote. And so she was seen, she's a trained economist, as somebody that might well actually be a sensible pair of hands. But I, I wonder whether she's gone full on Looney Tunes since she actually got the big gig and got somebody to knock out the lavatory in the, in, in the Treasury and uh, gave her, her her big abacus of, of, of financial joy and her spreadsheets to work with. Uh, is she on to something here? Is she a steady pair of hands? And what is she going to do with advice like you might need to raise tax even further? Bearing in mind, she sort of pincered herself in to this we won't raise tax rhetoric. Well, what a load of old twaddle this is. Oh, you <laughs> might need to raise 25, 26 billion. Let's make up a few more figures, shall we? You don't need to raise money necessarily in order to be able to keep things the same as long as you stop spending money unnecessarily. It's like any household thing. It's like me when I'm running out of money. I can, I've got a choice. I can either earn a load more or spend a lot less. And there are different ways of doing that. I mean, we could start by saving a lot of money by not 
spending anywhere near the amount we do, for example, on international aid, I think a lot of our um, listeners and viewers would think that there was a very strong case yeah. when times are tough, not to be throwing quite literally billions of pounds at weird and wonderful and wackadoodle projects, often in countries that are doing pretty nicely, thank you very much. I mean, People may have thought all this stuff stopped when they actually disbanded the Department for International Development, but I'm very sorry to say it hasn't stopped at all. We still give huge amounts of money. That's a luxury. You know, we're proud in Britain of being generous, of helping countries in need, and particularly after disasters and so on. But there's so much fat that could be trimmed there. Then there's the HS2 utter disaster vanity project that's never, ever going anywhere. Uh, I mean, and any number of other projects that could be sliced and diced and frankly binned, and then there would be no need whatsoever to go on and on and on about taxing more people. You know, we've, we've talked about this so many times. You carry on hammering people that earn above the average. They're going to find ways uh, to, frankly, either leave the country or just stop doing the extra yeah. work is needed for the economy. I mean, you can't make it up. Encouraging people to leave the country who create wealth and inviting people in on small boats who create zero. I mean, that's literally oh, where oh, we are at. Tunes, aren't they? They're all Looney Tunes. Just, but this is like a, a parallel universe. Uh, maybe we're not really having this conversation, Isabel. Maybe this is just a, a dream that we're having simultaneously about this nonsense. I don't know. Well, if that's the case, I sure as hell would quite like to wake up from it and yep. discover that the actual agenda here is a sensible one from which more <laughs> people are going to, to benefit rather than, I don't know, cleaners that work two days and decide it's time to take a tribunal. Yeah, absolutely.